<clears throat> Welcome back to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is June 25th, 2021, and I have the pleasure of being here again with Mari Nieves Alba for part two of her oral history. We covered so much ground in part one, but there are at least two additional aspects of your life that you'd like to say more about. The work you've done and continue to do professionally and your experience of motherhood. I'm sure there might be other things that come up as well. So you can pick up wherever you'd like. Thank you so much. Um, I guess this morning I'm thinking about, um, I'm actually thinking about the intersections, right, between motherhood and my professional life because I spent a great deal over a decade of my professional life in education, um, in the sort of a non-traditional sector of education, really focusing on education equity issues um, through my work in the community schools movement. And so I actually ran a community school for over 12 years in Washington Heights, which is northern Manhattan. But I really came to that work as a direct result of my experience as a public school student in the Bronx. Sure. Um, I think having had the experience of having been a public school student in the South Bronx and then a prep school student on the Upper East Side and having really understood sort of what the vast landscape of education looks like in this country, um, the disparities, of course, um, between what is available to you know, black and brown and low income children and their families and what's available to families with privilege, economic privilege and other privileges. Um, education has sort of always been a pillar of my professional um, life. And so I decided very early on, I did not want to be a teacher. I had an aunt um, who's very close to me, who uh, was a New York City public school teacher on Mohegan Avenue for over 30 years. Wow. Um, and, and it was truly her vocation. I and mean, she was like promoted. I think she was promoted to like assistant principal at one point and then actually asked to be returned to the classroom um, because she was so like in love with her role as a teacher. So I have a great, great respect for teachers, traditional teachers. And there's absolutely an element of my, I think of like my being, right? Of who I am in the world that is a teacher. Um, today I'm a, I'm a, for, you know, I professionally work in capacity building and training. So I'm teaching adults all of the time. Um, but I think, you know, with education in particular, I spent the first decade of my career in the arts. Um, and I've always sort of had these parallel lives where I'm actively, you know, usually I'm focused more on one than the other. And then the other is um, somehow in my life. So for the first 10 years, I worked in the arts mm -hmm. and then I worked in youth development sort of as a secondary function. Um, so doing youth advocacy, teaching um, in non-traditional settings. So I worked in, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn at El Puente Academy for Peace and Justice. Mm. I actually worked um, at the Fannie Lou Hamer Freedom High School oh, in wow. the Bronx, right off of the Bruckner Boulevard, um, and a number of other schools, but doing youth development and youth leadership work. And that was sort of the way that I kept my foot in youth and education work while working full-time professionally as a curator and producer in the arts. Sure, yeah. Um, and then, you know, the work in the arts took me, I worked with the Caribbean Cultural Center, the Hip Hop Theater Festival, um, you know, a number of consultancies with organizations around the country and around the world. And, and I love that work very much. That work, you know, my work in the arts has literally taken me across the world. Um, but I realized that I wanted to sort of be anchored in a physical geographic community again. And at that time I lived in East Harlem. Mm. Um, I lived in East Harlem for over 10 years. And, you know, I just, I, I was thinking through like, what are all of the things that I had witnessed, right? Um, both in my own life experience, but also professionally in my work in youth development. And, you know, what was missing for me was sort of a holistic intervention and a holistic approach that would really start to tackle the conditions that were creating the disparities and the conditions that were creating the fundamental inequity, sure. right? Um, for youth of color and low income youth and immigrant youth. And so somehow in my research, I came across community schools and I was like, you know, a, a, a group of friends and I who actually worked in the arts together at some point, all very entrepreneurial, you know, um, 
with different backgrounds, all, you know, all but one New York City kids. It was like my, my friend who was like, you know, Jewish artist from Queens, you know, a Puerto Rican artist from Brooklyn, myself, and then an African American, um, another African American brother who studied in New York. He was at Columbia. Um, we were like, you know, we want to start a school, but we want a school that has everything a kid needs. So the, the, it needs to have, you know, arts programs and it needs to have a clinic and it needs to have a food pantry and it needs to have, you know, um, a thrift store so parents can access affordable clothing and it needs to have and it needs to have and it needs to have. And we had this long list of all the things it needed to have. And in sort of preparing to start to think about the design of this school and this is probably in about 2000 2001 um maybe like 2002 2003 um i came across this idea of community schools you know it was like i'm researching and i hear oh community schools and this is like still the beginning of the internet so it's not quite like google <laughs> you know <laughs> the expansive universe of google um, but I'm hearing murmurings of community schools. And so several years later, I really stayed kind of grounded in the arts. But several years later, when I came to this feeling of like, I want to be grounded in a geographic place, right? I don't want to be on an airplane all the time. Yeah. I, don't, I don't necessarily want to always be just in an ideological community. Like ideological communities are very important. But it was like a lot of um, ideological discourse without a connection to like actual material gains right um or like hands-on work i like sweat equity um and i think that comes from the tradition right of the black panthers and the young lords like you have ideology but you also feed people yeah um so i eventually in about 2006 i i saw a job posting for the role of community school director at my elementary school at CS61, where I graduated from. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like this person is responsible for directing, you know, an entire team of people who is bringing services into the school, yeah. which was like part of the model we had envisioned. And so I interviewed and I made it to the finalist role and but remember i just spent like 10 years you know speaking at universities and museums and producing concerts and doing all of this work and the education and youth development stuff was sort of secondary yeah um so they called me back and they were like you were a great candidate but we're going to give it to someone within our network who like already works for us and we're going to kind of do an internal transfer but thank you so much for your interest so i was so disappointed because i thought like CS61, it was meant to be. It was like my elementary yeah. school. And then just a few months later, another role became available at a school in Washington Heights, the same exact role. And what I didn't know was that the school in Washington Heights, which I later came to direct, was the second oldest middle school community school in the country. Wow. Also one of the largest, you know, had been around for over 20 years and was sort of used as a model for community schools around the world. Yeah. So it was definitely, I think, a, a question of divine timing. I interviewed for that one and I actually got that role and ended up kind of taking on a much larger role, much larger budget, much larger staff, um, and a place that was historically very significant to the organization that I worked for. And as a result of that, ended up becoming um, one of the trainers for the National Center for Community Schools. Mm. Um, it was sort of a, an extension of, of my work as a community school director. So, you know, that work really was what I needed at the time in terms of like fulfilling this need to be located in a very, I was, you know, my school was on 168th Street in Jamel Place and my children came and young people came from like every, from 145th to, you know, 190th Street yeah. in Washington Heights, you know, Dykeman, Hamilton Heights, Upper Manhattan. Um, and all of the things that I believe politically, I was able to start to address in very concrete terms. Absolutely. Um, through my work with the young people and their families. And of course, the community school isn't just open to students and families, but it's actually open to the physical community that surrounds the school. Yeah. Um, so for many years, you know, for 12 years, I did that role. Um, I, I actually was hired as the assistant community school director 
and my director resigned within two months of my arrival. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was the interim director for six months, and then I was promoted. So after about seven or eight months, I was promoted to community school director. Um, and then at some point <clears throat> in the late 2000s, you know, I missed deeply my work in the arts. Yeah. And so I was, I was on a bunch of boards and, you know, sort of doing consulting work, but I, I brought the, a project the, my, my school was actually the hub for one of the 10 national Alvin Ailey dance camps. Oh, wow. um, and we had, you know, over a dozen community partnerships with different organizations around New York to bring the arts and other um, enrichment activities into the school. And so I kind of wrote a new job description for myself. And I was like, I want to be the director of arts program for the entire network of schools, not just yeah. my school. Yeah. And I, I thought it was a, I thought it was a, you know, a long shot um, and actually started looking for jobs outside of Children's Aid Society and got a job offer outside of Children's Aid Society. Um, and then my boss was like, no, we're going to meet your request and we're going to give you a raise and we're going to wow. let you become the director of arts for the whole network. Yeah. Which, which was also like for me really special because the only other formal on record director of arts for the Children's Aid Society up until that point was Langston Hughes. <laughs> right. That's, and so that, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> that was like mind blowing for me because I was like, wait, Langston Hughes used to work with children and like run after school programs. That's impossible. <laughs> like nowhere in my narrative of Langston Hughes did I imagine him as an after school teacher or coordinator yeah, same. Um, <laughs> or any of that. Right. Yeah. And so, and I'm a writer, right? Like I'm a writer and I have all of these writers dreams that sometimes don't get enough attention because I'm working. Right. Sure. Sure. And so I think that was like the greatest gift of that experience. I mean, there were many gifts in that experience, but one of the greatest gifts was like the realization that Langston Hughes was like a regular person who <laughs> had to pay his rent and, you know, and, and married his love of the arts with his love of his people yeah. and was like an after school program director and arts director for the Children's Aid Society in Harlem. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, that's what I did through about 2019. And now I am a national training design director for the Center for Popular Democracy. Mm. So I, I help to do capacity building and training for, you know, a national network of over 50 social justice organizations around the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I'm back in my, you know, I've panned out again from very hyper local work to um, national work which is still somewhat helps to tap me into local happenings because my, um, the, the organizations that I work with, you know, are farm workers in Oregon or immigrant rights, um, immigrants, you know, in Washington, DC yeah. or Brooklyn, um, or Queens. And so I get to actually, you know, support them in whatever work they're doing in their very local communities, um, while still kind of taking a national, lens and um kind of having the the, the eagle eye view um of what of what's moving on the ground for people sure. so, I mean, even in like places like west virginia you yeah. know um where folks the descendants of coal miners are like organizing for economic rights you know yeah. um it's a really wide range of experiences and i i love that work because it you know it i think it's um it's inspiring really to see people of all walks of life, you know, very racially diverse. It's a multiracial um, organization, um, but that is rooted in the experiences of very specific communities. So like black people in Brooklyn, you know, Mexican farm workers in Oregon, you know, white coal miners descendants in West Virginia, like, yeah. and in all of these communities around the country, people are, you know, ultimately like fighting for justice. Um, for their communities and so that's that's sort of what I've been doing and then actively I'm going to say this out loud it's a little scary but like actively trying to return to writing I'm writing but there's you know anybody who writes knows it's like a long process and then there's the publishing part which comes after <laughs> yeah. so um it isn't labor that you see immediate fruits of but yeah but it's it's what I'm trying to do at this time. Um, so I think to answer, I guess, the second part of 
of your inquiry. It's like, you know, all of that coupled with motherhood is a, is a very interesting thing because it's really funny as I sort of left the education justice and education equity sector, right? Working in community schools. It's like, I'm, I'm literally in the throes of like the school age <laughs> parent. Yeah. Um, education struggle in New York City. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's the largest school system in the country. And I would say, you know, it's, it's documented, it's evidence that it's the most segregated. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and, you know, as someone who dedicated like over a decade of my life to ensuring that children in public schools have equal opportunity, not even equal opportunities, but like an equitable um, stake, you know, in their own education. I think as a mother, it's really hard because, you know, and, and I experienced some of this, you know, I was a mother and a community school director at the same time for about nine years. Um, I think, you know, you experience the powerlessness or the sense of like frustration. You know, I'm certainly more privileged than a lot of people because I know how to navigate the system. Um, and I know where to look for resources and I know what the better schools are and I know, and I know, and I know, sure. but ultimately there is a systemic, there are many systemic flaws, Yeah. you know, fundamental flaws with the system that make accessing a high quality education extremely difficult in this city. Absolutely. Um, so we're kind of in the throes of middle school admissions. Uh, <laughs> my, like you, yeah. yeah my son was like waitlisted to a citywide um gifted and talented school and waitlisted to a bunch of you know really good charter schools and got into a relatively decent public school that's really far away from my house <laughs> um so we're just like navigating all of that you know and I think um as I think about like mothering in New York City and parenting in New York City, I think, you know, even beyond education, when you look even earlier to childcare, right? Like yeah. so many things are deeply impacted for parents when they don't have access to like high quality childcare, when they don't have access to high quality education, when they don't have access to high quality after school programs so that they can work. Um, and our city is largely, you know, in the last few years, there have been some shifts in the city um, through the Department of Youth and Community Development under de Blasio, Mayor de Blasio, there have been some expansions of after-school programs, for example, and universal pre-K. And those, those programs have helped to plug some of the holes, but the, the sort of the bureaucracy and, you know, the sort of complexity of like what it takes to be able to access these things yeah um and even the governmental kind of culture of you know i feel like this might be a staple of governments in general but particularly large governments large municipal governments um i find government to be generally very inefficient <laughs> but yeah. right um it's like you know, the culture of, because th these public programs are so centralized and controlled centrally, there's very little regard or foresight around, for example, timeliness sure. and like informing parents or informing caregivers, you know, of really important things. So you have parents like waiting till like the you know, the city, my son got into a city summer program and like, I just, that starts on July 6th and I just got a notification for it yesterday wow. and there's, there's still no schedule and there's still no program. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I've already made the decision that he's not going to go yeah. because I can't, I can't commit to something that I have no information about. Right. Sure. Um, and thankfully I have other options, but not all families do. And so then what that says is that if you don't have the privilege of other options, you are subject mm -hmm. to the whim <laughs> of the government, its inefficiency, and, and its general lack of regard for the fact that the people who receive public services and rely on them, fundamentally rely on them, um, also deserve to be considered, right? Um, yeah. 
and it's we see this you know in, in healthcare we see it across like all domains of the public sector but it's sort of like you're at the um, mercy if you will <clears throat> of whatever public agency you are relying on for a an essential service and i think that you know those are some of the things that i think about in terms of um the world that we want to build right um it's like how do we transform those conditions because people tend to think of like oh well it's you know not everyone relies on yes it's true that not everyone relies on public public services but our city is a city of working people yeah um and so people you know across the spectrum of experience actually do rely on public services oh definitely yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know um, and we pay for those public services, right? Oh, yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> we actually pay for them. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Those are some of my random ruminations this morning, just thinking about, like, how all of it, you know, at a system level and an individual level, it all kind of, um, how it all, it's like the same, pro I'm, I'm confronting the same set of problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what? Um, at different levels in different areas of my life and thinking through solutions right as well yeah yeah definitely i mean one thing one thing that has definitely come out in the bronx african-american history project and has already started to come out in the bronx latino history project we talked about it a little i think the last part was just um a lot of the things that we're having to fight for now whether it's more robust you know uh community services or after school uh programs etc cetera, etc cetera. and also for you know a kind of community control over those services a decentralized approach a lot of those fights were waged successfully in the past um and we're having to wage them all all over again i mean you know we talked i think um uh, last time about just how robust like the musical programming used to be um and you know there are still traces of it i think um uh various kinds of after school programming when when you um uh, went to school in the bronx and most of those have been eviscerated and are slowly being you know fought back for but also you know the centralized the question of decentralization i think was um so fiercely fought in the bronx and harlem especially in like the 70s and uh um but once again you know ha having to fight them again that's it's kind of a the cyclical nature of stru struggle i think is coming out a lot in these oral histories and Absolutely. You know, of course in the midst of the struggles the people who are against any kind of movement claim that these things never happen and that, <laughs> you know we just have to settle for what's given to us but um right uh, exactly but yeah it's it, it, just something i was thinking of when you were talking <laughs> you know it it one of the good things about doing oral histories with people from different generations is that that starts to come out more and um uh you know we will ho hopefully have a, a very robust um archive of of people's experience to draw from and inform and um strengthen some of these struggles as well eventually um absolutely i mean you know my son attended a progressive quote unquote a small progressive um parent you know founded public school in Harlem and it's co-located with another school um <clears throat> but his school was like very small had a very particular approach to education and was very greatly influenced by the needs of parents and what I found really interesting having the experience of being a parent in that school I loved his school it was an amazing school um was that you know there was a significant population of middle class and upper middle class white parents um, who were sort of the newcomers to Harlem, mm. who, you know, whose sense of, and this isn't a, a, a critique or a condemnation, but really like an observation, right? Sure, sure. Who's, whose sense of what they deserve and what their children deserve being very different yeah. from, excuse me, the parents of, you know, the other mostly children of color, mostly immigrant children, um, mostly low income and working class children whose parents didn't have the same sense of, you know, how they could navigate the system and not just navigate the system, but actually make demands of the system. Yeah. Um, the parents at my son's school were like very demanding. And as a result of it, we had lots and lots of things <laughs> that, <laughs> that I believe actually all kids deserve. Oh, 100%. Right? Yeah. And so it's like, how do you, 
why do you have to have you know this paradigm where you know you you literally have to fight to get more than scraps you know that's sort of the that's sort of the standard in our public services right in our yeah. in our public sector is like we'll give you the bare minimum <laughs> yeah and we'll do it all at the very last minute and you know i hope that in 50 years if somebody watches this interview they're like there's like this transformative new structure of government <laughs> oh yeah me too me <laughs> that too. centers our humanity right and our needs as, as, a, as like a community um and it's way more efficient um, and it's innovative and it's creative and is um, more than anything committed to creating conditions of well-being for all people. Yeah. Right? Um, but it's really interesting. Yeah. Like being there and, and seeing how parents are, you know, they, they like they literally will, you know, if some a single thing is out of order, it's like there's a meeting, there's a demand on the principal. We have a fabulous principal. Um, but it's like a week doesn't pass that the issue isn't resolved, yeah. you know, um, yeah. whereas that hasn't been my experience working in public schools. And in fact, a lot of the work that I did in public schools was educating parents, training parents to be advocates, training parents to organize, you know, for services, whether it's school based health centers or after school programs or child care, um, you know, IEP rights for, for children with special needs. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's definitely interesting to kind of like marry all of those perspectives, you know, in my one brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what are some of the most, uh, either memorable or, um, some of the most like creative, um, uh, or, you know, just an otherwise uh, noteworthy, like, um, projects that you have done um, professionally in the you know various different capacities, whether it's um, artistic director um, of the Children's Aid Society or um, you know the director of the community school that you worked for, um, a really you know or or your current work now, just some of the most memorable things that you've done. Yeah, I think um, early on, you know, I worked with the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute. I still work with them now in as a consulting capacity. I, you know, I've had like 20 plus years of working with them in different capacities. But back then, um, in the late 90s, I was the program director there. And um, just the experience of bringing so many artists, Caribbean artists and traditional artists in particular. I mean, we, we worked the spectrum of like from traditional, you know, what's called folklore, world music to popular. Um, artists, but really for me was like seeing traditionalists, seeing um, masters of traditional arts on stage like Lincoln Center or, you know, um, had a wide range of festivals and the affirmation, you know, and celebration that, that, it, that you get to participate in and bear witness to, right? When you go into a community and they see what is typically hidden or invisibilized on a, on a large stage, right? It's affirming and it makes you think so much about the importance of <clears throat> culturally responsive anything, Definitely. right? Like everyone wants to be seen. And so, you know, when I think of like culture and, and cultural strategy and, you know, what I call like cultural work, right? Um, in regard even to like things like education, it's just like this idea that <clears throat> anyone who gets to see themselves affirmed in a positive light actually has the opportunity then to have um, a deep sense of self-worth, um, of value, um, and even of power, right? Sure. Um, power and, and also agency. And I think the arts for me, you know, my work with the Caribbean Cultural Center and later, um, I got a fellowship from a Soros uh, Foundation, a community, New York City actually community fellowship. And I did some work around like hip hop and social justice which then morphed into a project with the hip hop theater festival called the International Hip Hop Exchange, mm. um, where I got to bring together artists, hip hop artists from around the world who were using hip hop to do sort of community based um, social justice or like social, socially transformative kind of work that married and lived at the intersection of arts and, um, you know, arts and justice, right? And a kind of giving space to like lots of different identities in places like Cuba and Puerto Rico and Ghana, um, Mexico. 
um, all of that stuff to me is like interrelated. I think like all of my work, what's special for me is not just like a single event, but it's like the, the thread, right, of connecting community, creativity, and social change um, in all of those spaces, right? Whether I was running a school or producing a concert, um, it's just this idea that culturally responsive, culturally grounded, and affirming work of any kind is actually like a staple it's something that we need to build power um and to create conditions of equity and justice um and well-being right for all communities and when we think about racial justice particularly given the political moment we're living in i think so much about you know the particularly the last year during the pandemic and uprisings and you know, the murders of innocent Black people and even Indigenous people and Latinx people, like, it's this idea that, like, the only time people of color see themselves in the news is when they're either being uh, terrorized <laughs> yeah. by the state um, or terrorized by the police or um, systemically and intentionally, like, excluded and marginalized and harmed. Yeah. And so you know, the counterpoint to that for me is like all of the work that, that I've done, not alone, but in community with others to, to actually build spaces that like affirm, uplift, and celebrate, excuse me, like all of the beautiful things that we are, um, you know, across the African diaspora, across the Caribbean, across the United States, around the world, like, you know, people of color are the majority of the planet. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and and um, I think it does harm to white people as well, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and, and that's something that I've tried to also, I've been thinking through a lot more because I work in a multiracial, sorry, my mic. I've been thinking through a lot more because I work in a multiracial organization and I've always had white allies, um, white allies and co-conspirators right as some yeah. folks say throughout my life you know my dad has always had there were always aunties and uncles that were white that were sure. you know that were friends that were political allies that we grew up with um and more so now that i work in a multiracial social justice organization i think you know white supremacy and that's all fundamentally is what we're talking about like you know our system right all of the flaws of our system are because it's a system of racial capitalism right yeah definitely um and it's and it's because white supremacy is sort of the code that um informs how we do everything in this society and so you know for white folks what that does is like it also i think does harm because not all white people you know white people are not choose consciously uh, none of us are consciously choosing to sign up for this <laughs> yeah. for this paradigm yeah. right so we all inherit it we all internalize it to some degree. And then depending on our positionality, we benefit from it to varying degrees, right? Um, and I think for white folks in particular, you know, there's an erasure as well, because, you know, as someone who is so culturally grounded in like who I am and where I'm from and where my people are from and where my ancestors are from and where we have been, you know, I, and I live in the Bronx and I'm a Bronx girl. So like I've been exposed to, to ethnic white communities my entire life from all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And see the beauty in that and see the richness in that and the diversity in that. And the fact that there isn't this like singular white experience. Right. Yeah. Um, and so then, but when you become white, quote unquote, in this society and you, in order to um, enjoy all of the power and privilege that gets associated with that, you actually have to erase all of those other things that you are. For sure, right? for sure. Um, so you're no longer the Italian or the Eastern European Jew or the Albanian or, you know, fill in the blank, right? Yeah. Or the Portuguese or the Spanish or the whatever you are, um, you're just white. And yeah. I think being just white is actually like a form of violence as well. Yeah, 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 for um, sure. It's a form of erasure as well. Irish, you know, <laughs> if you're in the Bronx, um so i've just been thinking through that as well you know and i think we're in this moment <clears throat> right now of awakening um because of the turmoil and because of the chaos and because of the loss um that the country has experienced certainly during 
the last administration. Yeah. <laughs> um, and since I think there are a lot of people of all races and, and like, you know, kind of walks of life kind of like awakening to the fact that this actually is harmful and it actually doesn't work. And it actually is going to, it's, it's almost like a, like a, um, in Spanish, you would say like, una condena, you know, it's like a condemnation. Yeah. It's like we are condemned to it unless yeah. we do something to change it. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm thinking about. <laughs> I know I, I went on I, sort yeah. of a long tangent, but. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, this is something that you've talked about throughout and, you know, that you touched on actually just um, a, a second ago as well. And it's very, you know, I think um, the answers are implicit in, in all of your responses already and, and very clear to me. Um, but just to hear your thoughts on it, uh, um, what would you say the impact on your life or um, how your life has been shaped by your uh, I would say your your parents, but really it goes back multiple generations. Your your whole family's kind of history of activism and fighting for justice. Um, how has that? How would you say anyway that that shaped your your life? I think um, obviously, like there's a there's a political foundation, an ideological more than political. There's an ideological foundation that informs. Um, much of what I do and like how I try to be in the world right so I think that's the first thing but I think concretely it was just something that people don't really talk about often and I've been talking about more lately because we are we are in a moment where young people in this country are sort of assuming um the role right a resistor again right yeah. um yeah. there's a there's a new there's a new resistance uh, being born and I think like, you know, on a very practical tip, just to start with myself and like the family I was immediately born into, you know, being that history has meant a lot of sacrifice yeah, um, and a lot of struggle. And I think um, people don't realize, I was recently on a panel with a bunch of children of Black Panthers and Young Lords. Yeah. Um, and the thing that we had in common that we somehow came to that we never talk about, we were all like, oh, I've never talked about this in public, <laughs> is that there was a tremendous amount of um, sacrifice and, and even like loss yeah. and harm that we all experienced um, because of our parents' political activity, right? Sure, yeah. um, some, some, of the, some of us have lost parents to prison, right? If, yeah. if our parents became political prisoners. Some of us have lost our parents to life, um, yeah. Your activists don't have a pension plan. They don't have a health care plan, you know, and, and there's certainly diversity. Like some of the, some of the people um, who did this work in the 60s and 70s have gone on to become professors and professionals. And, but the vast majority of folks who did that work did not. They, yeah. they actually remained in the social class that they were born into. Absolutely, yeah. Right? And so remaining in the social class that they were born into means that they're still low income and or working class for the most part and still subject to the conditions of what that means. And so I think like, you know, what part of how it's affected me is just, I have a, I feel like I have a very, um, a sensibility or like a deep awareness around class <laughs> in particular. Yeah. Um, I feel like I, I also have like, you know, our, what people don't realize about like that era in our history, <clears throat> the Black Power movement and all of the subsequent movements, you know, the Young Lords, et cetera, is that the people running those movements were incredibly young, uh -huh, right? Absolutely. 14, 15 a lot of times. Right. And so, you know, when you're 14, 19, even 20, 21, you don't have a world of life experience and you also may not have like a long view of what the, the future is supposed to look like. Yeah, yeah. You know, the people who were called to resist, right, our revolutionaries, if you will, yeah. did so out of a need, out of a sense of urgency, out of a sense of this is what we need to do right now in order to survive and potentially create conditions so that our future generations can survive and maybe thrive. Sure but they were incredibly young. And so 
they didn't think about, am I going to be able to retire? Do I, you know, how do I take care of my health? Yeah. Did I keep my, you know, so you have a lot of, you know, people, elders that I call elders with health, chronic health issues, broken families, you know, just to be really like explicit. It's not all romance and glory. Absolutely. Right. Um, um, and so when I think about political work or just activism or organizing and social justice, that's the thing that I bring that's different and I think is really central for a lot of people in my generation, but more so in the younger generations that are coming up is this idea of like holism yeah. and, and like having healing. And certainly there were elders that also believe these things. I don't know that they were the majority though. Sure. Right. <clears throat> There's this idea that like healing has to be in what is now called like healing justice has to be a central part of any work that we do um, in social justice. Yeah. Right. Because there is an inherent trauma that all of us are experiencing beyond our individual conditions and circumstances and individual traumas that people may be experiencing. There is a collective trauma. Sure. There is collective harm that we are experiencing. Um, excuse me, there's collective violence that we are experiencing. And even if you are not the direct target of those traumas and violences and harm, you are witnessing it, right? Yeah. And we know there's vicarious trauma, yeah. right? Um, it does something to your psyche and, and by extension to your body, potentially to your mind, um, to see yourself and your people under attack. Yeah. And so I think for me, you know, I have a very different my The way that my dad would do things and the way that I would do things are radically different. Yeah, like I'm, yeah. I'm really clear. And it's not that the way he did is right or wrong. Sure. I have deep admiration and respect for everything he does and his, what elders have done. Um, but I think like what I'm a very keenly aware of <clears throat> that I think, again, in his generation, there was a, some awareness of, but it wasn't maybe as fully developed as a concept is the fact that like there are actually many roles to play yeah. in a social justice movement. And when I think about like building a new world, right. Or building a world where we can all be well. Yeah. I'm like, we actually need like teachers who are radical. We need doctors who are radical. We need builders who are radical. We need yeah. every single sector of the society to radically uh, or to consider uprooting yeah. everything that doesn't work. Absolutely. And then have enough like radical imagination to envision an alternative. Yeah. Um, and not just envision an alternative, but create an alternative um, that, that creates the, you know, creates the conditions that we want. Yeah. And so, you know, I've done the protest and the kind of what you call like frontline organizing, but I, I, at this stage of my life, and even at an earlier stage of my life, I was like super clear that that's not all I want to do. And that's not actually the, the role that I want to center as my primary role. Sure, sure. Um, like I said, even though I have a resistance to being a teacher, I'm, I'm really clear that teaching is, is, is my role yeah. um, in non-traditional settings, right? Whether that's through culture, whether that's through actual like education, whether that's through training, um, so I'm clear, like wherever I go in the world, in whatever capacity, political education and like rooting folks in, in ideological um, alternatives to our current system, like that's part of my role. Um, and also mothering and raising a child who is healthy and who is um, clear about who he is in the world and, and what his responsibility will be to the world is also part of that. I mean, people also, you know, I know so many elders who, there are many elder women who are kind of like highlighted when we talk about the past, but there were many dozens, hundreds of women who were completely invisible, yeah. who were in the movement because they were home raising the kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely, right? definitely. And, and doing so much of the work, you know, sometimes that was, that had to get done a lot of the work behind the scenes and, you know, not getting any, you know, of the uh, upfront credit for it or things like that. But so many, so many women like that. Absolutely. 
you know and so i think like motherhood is a form of resistance especially if you if under the conditions that we live you you know you <clears throat> consciously are trying to create the healthiest <laughs> conditions for not only your children but the other children like you know motherhood is is a collective experience yeah um even when you don't know them all of the mothers of the world are your people on some level yeah yeah um and i think also like you know <clears throat> excuse me there's a there's a something that I, you know i i think my like my belief is like i want my child to be like better than me right yeah and like so i hope that every generation is like more evolved than the last not that there's any judgment cast on the past but sure. it's sort of like we want to be constantly evolving and growing and for me like the thing that i think was missing from the past that is very central and present for me is that like families are actually a unit of social change yeah so whereas in the past many people may have had to sacrifice families and family life i actually want to center that like if the movement doesn't have space for families for children for parents for caregivers yeah um for people who need care right besides children sure then it's then it's not a movement for everybody no not at all um and it needs to be so i think that for me is like a central part of how i do my work today like i literally work with organizers every single day and you know yesterday i was running a training a 4 hour training on specifically on healing justice and like preparing organizers to center and you know it's not like let's sit around and meditate all day like yeah there's a component of like self care and wellness and healing modalities yeah but there's also like another really important part which is more about creating a reflective space where people can actually pull themselves out of automatic mode and and consciously and intentionally think about like what is my role what are the strategies that i believe will work for where to get me where me and the people that i work with where i want to be and then how do we do that in a way that minimizes harm and also helps us recover from harm sure um consciously as opposed to like i am the sacrificial lamb <laughs> I, you know Yo, i am the martyr i can take all the hits i think our elders were like we'll take all the hits we don't care yeah you know and i respect and love them for that yeah and i don't think that's sustainable yeah ag ag agreed agreed um yeah you know um as you were talking i was reminded of it's <laughs> It's a book I read a few years ago, um, and I remember really enjoying it and getting a lot from it when I read it. Um, and I wonder if, if you'd come across it, because I'm sure you'd enjoy it if you haven't. Um, it's Michael Talsig, Shamanism, Colonialism, and the Wild Man. Ooh, I'm going to read this. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, like, it's, it's, it's a pretty, um, it, although it's a, written by an academic, it's a pretty, like, free-form book intentionally. So... And it's all about um, like the healing practices of shamans in Colombia and processing the trauma of colonialism through those practices. Um, uh, it's re really, really excellent. And um, I think uh, <coughs> along with what you're saying, um, I mean, obviously there's people who, uh, who take up more obvious forms of, of resistance uh, um to to contest imperialism um but but he 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 thinks that these practices are really really central to people overcoming some of the you know long gen multi generational histories of uh violence of you know first uh colonialism and now all different kinds of forms of uh neo colonialism and all um but yeah i was i was just reminded of that when you were speaking um i'm excited i just put it in my cart <laughs> yeah yeah it's I just long put it in my book cart it's long it took me a long time to get through but it's definitely a rewarding read um um for sure um i but appreciate yeah. that thank you <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i think i think it is really important uh to um to center uh, uh healing in any kind of uh um uh, movements for justice now and um i'm glad that it's you know i'm glad that it's become almost not not completely but almost taken for granted for um as far as people 
assuming that that's absolutely integral um, now. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm reminded of some other oral histories that I've done through the Bronx African American History Project with a building um, that it was it had a large population of communists in the 30s and 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. um, and you know a, a portion of them were black communists. Uh, um, and you know, so many of these I'm, I've done oral histories with children of these communists, and so many of them, you know, have a very had a very similar experience where their parents were either under constant surveillance, and that's tra that's extremely traumatic, of course. Or you know, there's one person I've interviewed whose father she didn't meet her father until she was uh, 12 because he was first underground, and then um, in a various federal penitentiary penitentiaries um so so yeah and that kind of i'm gonna just sacrifice everything for the movement was taken for granted for but it also i think um uh made it a little unsustainable especially to pass on to next generations i mean when you when your your primary caregivers are taken from you for all of your life uh it's hard really to have any kind of basis from which to uh, wage any struggle on your own after that. Um, but, but yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll look forward. I'm sure that, um, I'm sure that, uh, as I interview more children of either young Lords or black Panthers or, um, you know, other, uh, other people, uh, whose parents were involved in, um, radical politics in the sixties and seventies, I'm sure a lot of this will, will come out even more, but I'm really grateful for you, you sharing this in such a clear and, um, clear manner that that I as as you're saying doesn't really get expressed too often. I feel like, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of taboo because I think you know <clears throat> there is. I really appreciate you sharing that about the children of communists because I think you know the first picture. I remember I was I think I was like four or five years old and my mom had a a picture of me in front of like St. Helena's right, yeah. my my old elementary school. And I was like, oh, I want to see the picture. And she was taking the picture out of the frame. And I just, you know, I'm a kid. So I must have been a little older, maybe six or seven. I, I you know, I just stuck my hand out because I like wanted to grab the picture. And my mom like pulled back and like pulled the picture toward her. And it was like a picture of me. So I was totally confused as to like why my mom didn't want me to touch the picture of myself. Yeah. Like, excuse me. And then at that point, she like paused. And she flipped the picture around. And actually on the back side of the picture, there was a clipping of a news article. And the news article was uh, about my dad when our apartment was raided by the FBI. Oh, wow. And the picture was like a headshot of my dad and then a picture of my crib smashed to pieces. Wow. Right. So what she was protecting me from was that picture. She didn't want me to see like the smashed crib or like my dad associated with the FBI. I had no idea that we have been, I, I, I literally had like very little, my brother is four years older than me and he has more memory of it, but I was literally a baby. So I, I didn't have a lot of memory of, you know, us being surveilled or like our apartment being raided or any of these things. And then but what I do have memory of is like the subsequent trauma, right? So like, which is like, you know, after you've been raided, my dad was raided, we were raided, my dad was kidnapped at one point, you know, um, by like agents of COINTELPRO, which were disguised as young lords, right? Wow. Like so many things, you know, after you go through an experience like that, you know, obviously and my dad was like always a like very loving and very himself my dad is like consistently himself yeah. <laughs> he just is himself there's no other way to make that it. impression uh, of for sure right but there was definitely a period of my childhood where he was you know not as like present right like it would be like he would I, I didn't know where he was or but I think my family knew but I was so small yeah. that I just I wasn't privy to that information you know um but I think so when, I, you know, when I talk about this thing of like family as a unit of social justice, you know, I think there's also an evaluation and an assessment of like, it, it's why it is important, I should say, to make an assessment of what role you want to play, yeah. right? 
Like I am clear and I don't think there's anything wrong with anybody who chooses another role. I am clear for myself as a single mother that I am not interested or divorced like single mother. I am not interested in placing my household in a position where my son's safety would be at risk. Yeah. Now the important kind of caveat or or point to make here is that I don't think many of our elders even thought of it that way. I'm certain that none of them wanted to, intended to, or thought that put, you know, would have consciously put their families at risk. Yeah. But this goes back to the point about youth. It goes back to the point about not understanding at that time, you know, they didn't know what they were up against with COINTELPRO. Oh, I know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It was a clandestine was- intervention designed to destroy them. Yeah. Right? And so I don't have any, you know, I don't have any, like, there's no judgment of that. It's just like, it was what it was. And what I've learned from that experience is that that's actually not a position I want to take. Yeah. But there are other roles that I will take and that I have taken and that I do take, right? Which is, yeah. like I said, it's the role of teacher. It's the role of healer. It's the role of connector. You know, it's the role of community builder. Like, you need all of those things to, to build a movement. Um, and, and we're all born with different gifts also, sure, right? Sure. So I feel, like, I feel like any movement should have space for everybody and that the way that you optimize kind of unleverage your human capital is by allowing everybody to do the thing they're really good at so you can be a revolutionary scholar you can be a revolutionary like i said doctor teacher builder architect like we actually need all of these things yeah um and i think it's erroneous it's like it's it's you know it's a limitation of of vision to to believe that the only role we have is on the front line of a protest yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's one of the roles, and that's that's the first responder role. Yeah, you know, our people, and 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 like I, you know, like I said, when I was in my twenties, I did it all the time. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. In my mid forties, <laughs> I don't, my life doesn't. I, I I do it sometimes or rarely, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, because I have other things going on, and it requires childcare, and it requires da da da, and it, you know. Yeah. Um. And it's like, and that's what young people should be doing. Like I, and I will make sure you have what you need to get on that front line. I will help resource that front line, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, For sure. So yeah, I think, I think that's, that's an important, um, I don't know. It's something that I think about that, you know, what's the, what's the, what's the (laughs) (laughs) 2.0? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and um, as, as important, uh, uh, as uh you know on on the ground direct action is uh ultimately the entire transformation of a society requires a lot more a lot more than that um it's a necessary starting place but um uh but ultimately you you have to have a whole mass movement behind you which isn't gonna all be able to um uh, you know or should even be able to do the same kind of actions um as uh, uh as you know the on the ground first responders as you call it i like that um yeah. but but yeah and we we'll, need storytellers so shout out to bronze oral history project like we need storytellers and i'm a storyteller like you know we need all of these things you need people to make the world beautiful so when you recover from the harm and the trauma you have a safe place to be and go you know there's so many things um that we need <laughs> Sorry absolutely. for the outburst. <laughs> no, absolutely, and and you know, I think I think um, I think a lot of these uh, insights were, as you already said, like present to a certain degree in in former generations. Like I think even of, you know, some of the work that the young lords did around, um, uh, like bringing to light the um, history of Puerto Ricans, because you know, I, I, like when I read some of the old issues of Palante. Um, and if I were to read things published around the same time, um, you know, there'd be basically nothing on the history of Puerto Rico outside of Palante. Like, um, so, you know, they mm-hmm. were doing the cultural work, they were doing a lot of the community work. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, I, I, I do think uh, uh, kind of more explicit 
um, focus on some of that and diversification of, uh, um, you know, who's doing what rather than one person having to do everything um, is a huge step up. Um, yeah. And there's so many, I think there's so many things that get lost, right? Also, if we don't take that holistic approach, I, there's a, um, excuse me, there's a South Asian um, kind of like social justice thinker named Deepa Ayer, who has something on um, what she called like the social change ecosystem. And I really love her framework because it, it actually speaks to like, you know, she kind of gives a breakdown of like all of the roles and, and, and also this idea that you can be fluid, right? Yeah. Like, you know, part of white supremacy is that everything has to exist in a binary. Yeah. Um, and just the idea that you can have a complex matrix of matrix of possibility, um, I think is really important. And but also that you can have fluidity. That yeah. you might be different things at different times or multiple things simultaneously. Um, it's not an either or, it's not a single way. Um I think that, that all of that is really important and all of that is what's actually emerging, right? Sure. Um, at this particular time, as, as young people and, and people my age, not, not quite young and not quite elder, um, and even for elders who are evolving in their own thinking many, many decades later, right? It's like yeah. that the times calls for something else. Definitely. Um, and I think our elders did what their time called for. Absolutely. Um, and what they knew to do and do well. Um, but I, 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 this idea of like fluidity and, and also the, an ecosystem, right? The fact yeah. that there are all these inter, interdependent elements um, that work in synergy with one another to create the whole, I think is really, really important. Um, and to your point around, you know, like the Young Lords and Palante in Puerto Rico, I went to, um, I went to Alabama to the Equal Justice Initiative and they have, you know, they have the lynching memorial, which is like their most well-known monument but they also have a small museum that's on like the history of um, incarceration. But it really is like, it draws a line from enslavement to the prison industrial complex. And, you know, in the section of, it's a small museum, but it's very powerful. In the section of the museum where they have the Jim Crow um, signs, yeah. you know, one of the most, I wasn't entirely surprised because my mom told me that when she arrived in the Bronx, there were still segregated places. Sure. Right? You know, she was born in Brooklyn. Um, they came to the Bronx, I think, when she was five. She was born on Schenectady Avenue in Brooklyn in her house. She was a home birth. Um, but then, like, moved to Soundview when she was five years old. So that was, like, 1959. And in 1959, and as she was growing up in her childhood, she remembers segregated places in the Bronx. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah. And so when I went to Alabama and I saw the Jim Crow, there's like a wall of Jim Crow signs, you know, like whites only, black, or rather, you know, whites only, you know, no black. It would be like no blacks, no dogs, no Mexicans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there were many, there were several signs that were like no blacks, no Puerto Ricans, P-O-R-T-O Ricans. Yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, and yeah. so even when we think about like these political solidarities that are organic and innate for us, you know, growing up in New York in the Bronx, it's like, you know, these are signs that were put in the in, in the South, yeah. you know, where maybe there was a smaller presence of, of Puerto Ricans. But the, the point of like, you know, I think that's been really important part of my racial formation as a mixed race Latina in New York City in the U.S. is that like, I was very clear because of my parents' experience, my father's experience as a darker skinned, you know, immigrant man, Spanish speaking man, because when he came to this country, he didn't speak English. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and my mom, who is a mixed race, Puerto Rican, you know, um, very like, very fair skinned, but my mom had seven siblings and like those siblings all had different racial phenotypes. Um, you know, my mom was the, the light skin with the large golden brown afro, you yeah. know? And my son favors her. He has her phenotype. Even though his father is a darker skinned Afro Puerto Rican, he's like lighter than both of us, but has my mom's golden brown, you know, African hair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which is like a whole nother discussion, right? On genes. Um, but you know, my mom, my mom and my dad's experience, racialized experiences as Latinos in the Bronx in a period where segregation still existed. Yeah. Um, in the Bronx you know, I think it was really important part of my own political formation and racialization because when my mom, you know, when I went to an all-white school, 
my mom was super clear, like part of her preparation for me to go to the white school was like, excuse me, it's very simple. was like, and you better remember you're not white. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you better remember you're not one of them. And it wasn't because of any particular disdain for white people. It was more to make, to keep me safe. Sure, absolutely. Because my mom, who, if she straightened her hair, could have passed for white, right? Um, her, you know, the joke was that she had like a Barbra Streisand nose. And I was like, you know, it, it was like literally a joke when I was a child. I was like, oh, you have Barbra Streisand's nose. So we're like, if you just straighten your hair, you know, with that nose, you can pass for like a Jewish person in the Bronx easily, yeah. right? But my mom was raised by her black grandfather and her black great uncle and her black grandmother. You know what I mean? So no matter how light she was, she could never be white because yeah, she understood yeah. that she was black. Right. Yeah. And at that time, when you think about like the one drop rule and how race is constructed in this country, sure. I know I know African Americans with my mom's exact same phenotype. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, definitely. So light as I am, mixed race as I am, I was super clear always we're not white and actually we're black too, and other things, because we're mixed, right? But we're also black. And yeah. you know, I think I think that's really interesting, you know, in terms of like when you talk about Puerto Ricans, the Puerto Ricans are very unique in the Latino universe, in the Latino cosmoverse, because, you know, there are jokes, right? Like there are lots of jokes in New York, especially, but, you know, um, maybe like a year ago during the uprising, there was a big issue around like whether or not Dominicans thought they were black. And there was like a lot of popular discourse around this. Yeah. And it was because of an incident that happened in, in Dykeman. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know what and, you mean. And there were all these memes. And the memes were like, the black Dominicans don't want to, you know, it was basically like black Dominicans don't, aren't black, don't want to be black. And all the light skinned Puerto Ricans think they're black. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is like, this is like the popular discourse. And it's like, no, we don't think we're black. Like, we're people of African descent. But because we are not all, some Puerto Ricans are unambiguously black. Right. Yeah. Um, but because some of us are also mixed. Yeah. Um, you know, some people are like, well, are you black? We're not quite sure. But in our culture and in our consciousness, we are black and we have yeah. been racialized in this particular country as black and yeah. as, yeah. you know, not depending on what part of the country you're in, it might vary. Um, but Puerto Ricans are like, I don't know, there's an interesting racialization with Puerto Ricans specifically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, that is different from other even like Spanish speaking Caribbean um communities that i think is is you know is worth exploring at some point <laughs> oh yeah yeah a hundred a hundred percent i think so too um yeah i'm i mean i um the the first place i thought of uh as far as segregation in the bronx goes is the shore haven um beach club uh which isn't too far from where um both of your parents uh um came, came of age uh and and yeah um some of the people that I have interviewed from this um, this communist building that I mentioned, because uh, um, there were there are people who both of whose parents were of African descent. There are people, you know, maybe one parent was of African descent, one parent was of Eastern European Jewish descent, but um, uh, but they would often, as part of uh, you know uh, civil rights activism, try to push. Um, this beach club in particular to see who they'd allow in and who they wouldn't. Um, mm -hmm. And even, even very um, uh, people of uh, maybe mixed backgrounds with very light phenotypes would often be turned away um, uh, at, at Shorehaven even. So um, yeah, there are plenty of other places around the Bronx as well, but um, I think that's one of the most notorious places that there was at the time. Um, Absolutely. Even like Parkchester, right? When it was, mm. when it was founded, yeah. um, you know, yeah. the self, self-sufficient community, you know, of everybody who, <laughs> or, or of whites only, right? Initially, yeah. which is interesting because now it's like, it's heavily black, you know, yeah. and heavily yeah. South Asian. Um, yeah, it's interesting stuff. I just had never thought of it, like being raised in the North until my mom, like, shared the stories of like segregation with me I hadn't even thought about it like she she'd always like I said taken a position on race 
but I never really understood why. And then I was like, what? There was like segregation in the Bronx? <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Um, and then it's like, oh yeah, I, I guess there was segregation in the Bronx, you know, like actual segregation, not like de facto segregation, but actual segregation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Well, uh, well, yeah, what, are there other um, things that you'd like to share, other things you'd like to speak about, other things that occur to you at the moment? You know, nothing comes to mind. Um, but I don't know if you have any questions. I feel like I just talk, 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 talk. <laughs> no, that's, that's great. Like I, like I said before, that's um, what makes the, uh, the richest oral histories. Um, uh, and I've I've contrib I've I've contributed more this time than I than I usually do too, but just because I the conversation I've really really enjoyed it so far, um, and uh, had had some things that uh, I thought you might enjoy as well. Um, Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah, I think I think we've covered at least everything that I had intended to ask you about. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share about um, uh, your son or anything along those lines or you, you shared everything you, you wanted to? Nothing. I think the thing that I, the last thing I would just say and share is like that I'm still, even with all of the, um, you know, the complexity and even the tension, you know, that exists here, um, one of the things I still really love about the Bronx is just like, is the diversity, but not like, I feel like Queens is the most diverse borough, right? And we hear all about that. But I feel like when I go to Queens, it's like diverse, but, but still um, kind of segregated, right? Yeah, and the Bronx is too, like we, oh, yeah. we have, we have existing segregation, but I, but there's also like a unique cultural fusion that exists here yeah. Um, yeah, yeah between different ethnic groups and even different races you know um and and i just think that that's a really special and unique part of new york that is really unseen like my friends and i i think i said this in the last interview but my friends and i who are from the bronx were like and and harlem as well um though harlem has slightly different dynamics it's like we always say like uptown is an identity <laughs> yeah 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 you know and I think like, and, and, and one of my really good friends who's Dominican, who lives here in the Bronx, and we were joking around and we're like, you just need like a New York City, no, not even a New York City, you want like a Bronx passport. Because if you have like the Bronx passport, that's just like a really unique identity <laughs> that no one else can replicate, you know? For sure, for sure. <laughs> Only in the Bronx do you go to a, like a, a, a Puerto Rican or an African American, <coughs> excuse me, my allergies are killing me. Um, a Puerto Rican or an African American gathering where like Italian food is a staple. Yeah. You know? Yeah, um, yeah. or you know, or you know, any mix that you can imagine. Um, you know, Puerto Ricans going uptown for oxtails and you know, Dominicans or rather African Americans coming for arroz con gandula. Like there's so much cultural yeah. sharing and fusion that happens naturally, not because of any like <clears throat> intentional or overt program but just because neighbors yeah. right are constantly in conversation with each other um and even as you know i've i've witnessed like neighbors and community members who like because of race or ethnicity don't speak to each other but their kids do yeah, yeah right yeah. and so then you still get <laughs> the fusion and you still get the integration um and i just think that's a really unique and beautiful part of like growing up here and I think my son is experiencing that um and it's something that it's something that I consciously wanted to give to him yeah. I was like if you if you're born into this that's like a very unique world view um and even if you don't stay here forever it's something you will carry with you like wherever you go in the world absolutely um, <clears throat> that is extremely valuable yeah um, so I guess that would be that would be my final thought yeah it's a, a wonderful <clears throat> thought to, to end on um I mean, I feel like in, I feel like in many ways, um, uh, the, the Bronx is kind of like almost, um, or at least the best, the best moments of the Bronx, like you said, there's definitely still plenty of areas of the Bronx, um, uh, that, uh, don't exhibit this, but the best moments of the Bronx are kind of like a foretaste 
of what um, human beings uh, could become, especially if we consciously applied ourselves, you know, rather than, I mean, this just has largely happened by chance and circumstance in the Bronx, but um, this kind of multi, uh, multinational global culture that has sprung up here is such a beautiful thing. Um, and uh, <laughs> like you said, I hope 50 years from now when someone, uh, if someone comes along and, and watches this, uh, um, they'll see many more examples of uh, that culture all over the globe kind of taken for granted for. Um, so, but thank you so much. Um, I really uh, enjoyed uh, uh, recording this oral history with you, both parts. And, um, and yeah, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording right now. Awesome. <clears throat>